Hi YouTube fans, this is Matt of Post April 6th YouTube channel. Well, I'm going to talk about another unfinished story. What it is about is about a young guy who is Hispanic, and so are his parents, at least his father anyway. His full name is Ronnie Joshua Ramirez. And he does not live in um, New York City. He does not live in um, Los Angeles. He does not live anywhere in California. He does not live in Chicago or Denver or anywhere in the state of Colorado. He lives in Cocker, or Cocker, C-A-W-K-E-R, Kansas. And the story starts where he talks about getting very, very brutally uh, bullied by three kids who are mean as any kids can get. In the, in the boys' bathroom. Yeah, they really bully him unmercifully. And they say some really sick racial epithets and some cuss words. Oh, yeah. They even accuse him of, uh, of uh, doing something to a mule that you should never, ever, ever, ever do. Uh, what that is, I'm not going to read that in the story, but it's um, it's quite sick. In fact, I'm going to leave that word out. Okay, so let me begin the reading. And, um, and I think you're going to find this story interesting. Cocker, Kansas is not the most unknown town in the state of Kansas and the area of the United States called flyover country. Cocker City has a public exhibit of the largest ball of twine in the world and is near Wakanda Lake, Kansas. Cocker City is not 98% white people. There are Indians, Hispanics, African Americans, and people of Asian ancestry residing there. Ronnie Joshua Ramirez was born at the township on August 28, 1964, and was the son of Hector. Manuel Ramirez, his father, and his, I should have put in mother, but I didn't, but his mother, Elizabeth Frida Colony Ramirez, she was only 23 on the day she gave birth to Rolando or Ronnie, as she, he prefers, as he preferred to be called. Ronnie had a good childhood, but one day, two new students and a bully who never liked Ronnie bullied him in the boys' bathroom at the only elementary school in the town. They came in after he finished relieving himself, and, there, and, and three of the nasty-minded students rushed in and proceeded to throw many handfuls of wetted peat moss gardening dirt and they called him I'm not going to say the one word but a greaser, a burrito eating fart maker a shit ass a I'm not going to say a thing of 
what, he, what they would think he would do with mules, a stinky bulldog, and a stupid tard. Tard meaning, you don't say the re retarded word, you say mentally challenged. But back then it was okay to say retarded. Okay. And Ronnie backed in a corner and pleaded, stop, stop! And after over five minutes of this cruel harassment, a tall, six foot seven, really muscular custodian named Barney blared his farmer's whistle and angrily told them to stop and lean up against the wall. And the toughest of the three gave him a dirty look and then said, with a dirty look, make me funny, the tough guy. He probably talked about it like that. And Barney grabbed him by the shoulder and slammed him up against the wall and said with his finger pointing in his face, look, I can bench press 250 pounds to throw the fir No, let me say that all over again. Excuse me. Look, I can bench press 300. I'm sorry about that. I did it again. Look, I can bench press 250 pounds. You throw the first punch, punch, punk, and I will beat your loser ass's face in. The bully named Steve stooped his head and felt ashamed and then walked to stand where his other friends were against the wall. On the other side of the boys' room. And then Barney walked over to Ronnie, who was panting, and both his eyes were open wide, and asked him how the incident started. Then, after spending a couple of minutes hearing Ronnie, Ronnie's side of the story, Barney then stands between Ronnie and the three other kids. Then the three kids, or uh, uh, excuse me, the three kids were named. Steve and the other two new ones were Jimmy and Clayton. Barney gave serious orders to everyone. He says, all right, here are the rules. Ronnie is going up to the principal's office. And you three, and he probably did this as he waved his finger a certain way, Troublemakers, as he scrolled his index figures, is what's in the story, which is true, if this were a real life situation, are going to the conference room down the hall from the principal's office and wait to be questioned by head principal Dr. Wapole. Then Barney motioned with his right hand, Okay, Ronnie, tell Dr. Wapole about these kids. And he will see to it they get punished damn good. They won't be doing this cruelty again. Ronnie nodded his head and left the large boys room and walked up to the principal's office. As soon as he arrived, he told his receptionist, a black haired lady in her 40s, what happened and gave Miss Ursula a brief description of the terrible prank. Meanwhile, before Ronnie arrived, Barney spoke
to the principal about the incident over the Motorola dispatch walkie-talkie. After Miss Ursula peeped into the principal's office, Ronti, or no, Ronnie faintly heard Dr. Wapole okay, tell him to come in. That's what Dr. Wapole said when he, after the waitress, or the receptionist <laughs> peeped her head into the principal's office. Because he said, okay, tell him to come in. I hope I can make him feel better. Then Ronnie entered. The principal could see clearly he had dirt stains on his shirt, and he could see that he was embarrassed. And after Ronnie talked to Dr. Wapole for over 10 minutes, the principal assured him that all three students will, be, will get extremely punished. And after that assurance, Dr. Wapole left the, the office and then talk, walked over to the conference room to talk with the three students named Steve, Jimmy, and Clayton. After the three young men were questioned for 20 minutes, the principals re re revealed their fates. And those fates were Steve, the biggest of them all, would be suspended from school for 10 days. And Jimmy and Clayton were suspended for seven days. Jimmy and Clayton were new students and brothers that had previously been students in Jennings, Missouri. Okay, let me, excuse me. Sorry, I had to get, I had to get the thing out of the way so I didn't keep bumping on the drive by. <laughs> okay. What, what I want to mention here is Jennings, Missouri is close to St. Louis, Missouri. Jennings is in the uh, St. Louis metro area. I know this for a fact because I was contemplating moving to Jennings, Missouri, but uh, I was advised even by the realtor, uh-uh. You're probably going to get your you're probably going to get your plumbing stolen. This is a very bad area. I would I would strongly advise you not to do it. Okay, so let me get back to the reading of the story. Well, after the principal returned, he brought him a Butterfingers candy bar and a can of Coca-Cola and gave him a boy's size 12 blank dark blue t-shirt and then called his parents his mother arrived about 15 minutes later and he got a nice ride home and the d day of March 29th 1975 ended on a positive note After he got home, his daddy showed up, or no, let me say that over again, excuse me. After he got home, his daddy showed a lot of sympathy and took him and his sister Amanda, along with his mother Elizabeth. All four of them. got to have sheer enjoyment of eating at Donnie and Ann's Old Diner on a quiet country road. After the diner, all four of them went along for a better ride. As dear old dad, being the driver to Solomon Springs Movie Theater to see a iconic actor named John the Duke Wayne as Brannigan, a tough Chicago PD detective busting a dangerous mobster. Because, see, there was such a movie. I've seen it over 15 times, and believe me, that movie is, shows how 
tough. Uh, even though in, in real life, John Wayne, that's not his nature, but he can, uh, John Wayne is very good at playing a very, very tough, uh, fearless uh, detective or, uh, you know, the, the type of guy that would be in a Western movie. Okay, let me get back to the reading here. Dad had to drive 17 miles to see the movie. Okay, let me stop reading again real, real, and, and explain that what that means really quick. Because see, I researched this. This movie theater does exist. And the distance from where they are to um, Solomon Springs uh, Theater is, is somewhere between 15 and 17 miles away from where they would live in Cocker. Wow, the movie was so much fun, Ronnie totally forgot about what happened in the restroom at the school. During the 1976-1977 school year, Ronnie was attending middle school at a different location. Um, I should not have put it that way. It would be more like between 1977 and 1979, approximately. Okay, but let me get back to the reading of the story, because it's going to get more interesting. Hi, Kitty, you can come up here with me. Come on. Well, we'll just let this thing be in the way. <laughs> okay, I'll continue reading. And during the 1979 to 1980 school, he attended Downs High School, because I, I did research about this. That is the name of the high school where, where uh, in, in Cocker or, or nearby Cocker uh, City, Kansas. And on May 29th, 1982, again, 1982, that was the year he graduated high school. Ronnie officially graduated high school and had a elaborate looking diploma certificate. And in the summer of 1982, until the early spring of 1983, Ronnie remained living in there and working as a cashier at one of two grocery stores in Cocker or Quaker uh, City. And in the spring of 1983, he was hired as a shift manager at a plush desirable location located in Denver, Colorado, located on East First Avenue and Steel Street. A quite well liked grocery mega conglomerate, conglomerate famously named Safeway. Because you see, from 1966 to 2017, the store was actually there. And in um, 2017, the lease expired and the store shut down because they just they just didn't want to be there anymore you know that was that was uh, Safeway's Safeway Albertson's decision more than likely okay okay so it says the district manager was grateful to take him on after re regrouping the store, after the previous general manager seriously mismanaged the store and had too many staff members doing things they were not supposed to do. After Ronnie lived in Denver for over a year, he was outshining the people that were experiencing an economic crash that affected Colorado. Because 
me, me making that statement, I swear to God, is true. Because back in the day, a little more than a... No, I take it back. Um, just a second. Five months after a certain date that I'm just about to discuss in the writing of the story, which for my father it would have been um, April of 1985. My father shut a decent repair business down because the economy was bad and he was not making much money. And he was tired of all the, you know, he, he doesn't go into any, a lot of specifics other than the fact that several of his good customers stopped doing business with him because they weren't working anymore or they went with somebody else or they went in a different direction, whatever direction that would, that would be for those customers. And my dad was just sick of the battle. And he shut the business down and a couple of months after he shut the business down, he went, to, he went and got hired on as a master mechanic somewhere else. I can't say what that is because if I do, boy, my dad's going to be really damned upset that I'm discussing something I'm not supposed to be. Okay, so let me get back to the story. Okay, after Ronnie Ronnie's new job acquirement at... An honorable career er, earning, learning, I should have said learning improvement, but it's earning improvement. He was accepted to become a tenant at 300 block of North University Boulevard in Cherry Creek North slash Denver 80206 zip code. See, there was actually physically an old apartment building that was there that was built in the early 60s late 50s early 60s and sometime between uh, 2013 and 2016 when I was away from there and living in Pueblo with my father um, that building was completely torn down and a nice restaurant called Hillstone Plus the plus a little bit larger um, parking space was available than what was there before. The the, the building was the, the the apartment building was demolished. Okay, let me get back to the rating again. He he would discover some major improvements that will make Cherry Creek a lot like the next. Rodeo Drive and Beverly Hills, California. Cherry Creek will become a secondary world famous landmark because what was going on there and what was rumored to happen next back in 1984 was the shopping mall that was on First Avenue on the north side no, correction, correction. The south side, between uh, First and University all the way back to about Steel Street. This is a distance of at least uh, five to seven blocks, city blocks. There was a, there was there was an outdoor shopping center there, but it was it didn't it didn't look all that good. And what they did was is they I think they tore something down based on some research I've done and they put up what is there now which is the cherry the indoor Cherry Creek Mall which is really wonderful and very classy and it's it's really a it's really a pleasant one of a kind experience just being inside there and if you don't want to go in there just go go to, to the stores but on 2nd Avenue and 3rd Avenue between um, University Boulevard, North University Boulevard all the way up to Adams. 
you're going to find a lot of really great stuff. And if you don't find any retail stores, you're going to see some pretty nice office stores. And a few uh, apartment buildings and hotels. It's, it's really just, you really feel like you're in La La Land just walking around in there. I know from personal experience. The number of times I've walked around in that area, personally, probably over 3,000, literally. I'm talking between 1992 and, uh, or no, late 1991 and uh, 2024. I'm not kidding. Okay, let me get back to the rating again. Okay. We experienced it. Due to the fact oil refineries were out of business and causing Denver to hit rock bottom economically. Because back then it's true. I mean, things were going like this. Business wise. And people were leaving in droves. Ronnie got a great deal on a 1980 Datsun compact or compact pickup truck and bought some new clothes and he would occasionally smoke a cigar that would be purchased at Tinderbox, Edwards Tobacco, Jerry's, Smokers Inn, Churchill, and Tobacco Leaf Collectibles. Now these tobacco shops I just mentioned, there's only three of them left. Edwards, and it's in a different location on Broadway now than it was back then, back in 1984. And Jerry's Tobacco Shop, it's in the same area but not the exact same address. It's on a different part of 16th Street Mall than where it was back when I started going there back in 1990. Back in 1995. And Smoker's Inn, gone. Churchill's, long, long, long gone. And Tobacco Leaf, it's still in the area, but it's uh, it's on a different part of West Alameda. I think it moved a couple of blocks away from where it was a year ago. Okay, let me get back to the reading of the story again. Story again. If you think his infliction in 1975 was bad. What would happen on Saturday, November 17, 1984, 11 days after the 40th president of the United States, Ronald W. Reagan, wins a major landslide? and carries 49 states and wins the most electoral votes a, present, a presidential candidate has ever gotten. Ronnie's day off from Safeway on a Saturday started out normal and then things got more and more strange. Here is recanting of what happened. Ron slept in after 11 hours of sleep after running a cash register from 3 p.m. to 1.50 a.m. and after a once in a lifetime 50 to 75 percent clearance sale at Safeway, Safeway Cherry Creek needed a massive sales quota improvement. So the store did not have to downsize or be closed down. The store sold 92% of the entire inventory. I mean, there was very little left. I bet you what they did, see if this was a real, if this was an actual truthful real life situation they would get a special they would call in some favors within, within corporate and they would have 
as many trucks as they could fit in the back area, like three trailer loads, chock full of a ton of merchandise, and they would have at least ten people between two a.m. when they close, or actually they probably closed it at midnight or after midnight. They they they, they extended their hours open till one a.m. and then and then. Fifteen minutes later, they they um, you know everybody clocked out and went home. You know from one a.m. until until I think the store would open around six or seven in the morning. They would have at least ten people inside there, stuck them like mad. I mean they're all moving around and they're all they're real, they're all really moving hard and they're sweating and 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 they're just working 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 working. You hear. You hear, you hear some supervisors yell, come on, move it, move it, move it, move it. Come on, get some more over there. Come on, move, move. You know, stuff like that. Okay, so let me get back to the reading again. Ronnie had to consume his lunch at the register because normally it, uh, under, under Colorado label laws, that's a big no-no, but... They, they they got away with it this time, but you can't keep doing that over and over again because they there could be some strict penalties by this uh, that would that would be imposed on the retail stores that would do that. Oh yeah, big big fine, probably over a, probably over a couple thousand dollars. And all of the registers together rang up over ninety-six thousand dollars in sales. After I uh, really thought about it, after I really truly thought about it, even with it being fifty to seventy-five percent off, you know what I think it would really be? It really truthfully be probably over a hundred thousand dollars, easily, even back then in nineteen eighty-four. Okay, just got a little bit more reading to do. After the shift ended, Buck Owenberg, the general manager, hands Ronnie a $50 bill as a bonus. Then he clocked out, shook hands a second time with Buck, and walked home. He was so tired, he had to watch where he was going, and he walked down... 2nd Avenue, and man, Cherry Cricket Bar and Grill was jam-packed and loud as hell. Because that, that place is still open, and, and it can get so busy out there, it, it actually is like that. It's very loud. Okay. Then he got to his apartment, he popped a Hot Pockets pizza pocket roll in the microwave, and then he stripped off his clothes and got to sleep. See, he did this after he scarfed down the 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 the, the Hot Pockets pizza because he was really hungry, and slept from 2:40 a.m. until. 1.34 p.m. That's 11 hours. It's got to be. Or 10.9 hours. And as soon as he wakes up, he, he runs to his nice little bathroom, and then after he does uh, some bodily functions I'm not going to say here, he then takes a, he, he he get then gets totally naked and he, he he takes a shower and he takes a long shower because he is sore from head to toe. Okay. So what happens next after he? Gets uh, shaved, brushes his teeth, um, gargles some mouthwash, 
whatever. He goes into his little kitchen. He makes a um, some eggs over easy, a couple of strips of either breakfast sausage or bacon, and um, he probably uh, he probably toasts a couple of eggo eggo waffles. <laughs> Because back then they didn't have as many choices as they have now. They only have like two or three, and now they have. Ego has probably at least seven or more than that. And uh, he looks at the newspaper that's waiting for him right in front of his uh, unit, and he doesn't have his car or his 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 his, his Datsun truck because. You see, the um, engine had a bad alternator, and it is at the repair shop that is reasonably priced, and he is, is the, 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 the alternator is on order, and it's going to take at least four days to get it. And once he... Um, once it gets installed, he's going to get a call after they've done a good test, a couple of tests and a, a test drive or two. And he's going to pay probably at least uh, $75, I would think. So what he does is um, he wants to go see a movie that is out there. And uh, for the life of me, I just don't remember. You know what? I take it back. I think this was still playing at the movie theaters, even back then. And it's this. And, it, and it's the last of the Oh God series or franchise that, that starred George Burns. Oh God, you devil. And what he does is he gets on an RTD bus and this one is an oldie. This one was made somewhere between 1964 in 1967. I mean, it was an oldie. And based on what I know about RTD buses and the old GMC buses that look similar to the RTD buses that didn't have the RTD logos on them, um, it probably had a inline straight 671 Detroit diesel or it had a V6 71 series Detroit diesel. And it's not super cold, but it probably snowed at least a little bit. About half an inch. You know, light, light snow, light flakes. He gets on a nice winter coat that has a nice hood on it. And he gets some jersey gloves, or some ski gloves, whatever he, whatever he liked, whatever he, was his thing. And he um, takes a ride to not something that is in, uh, not something that's on Downing and Sixth. It would be this one, South Glen. I think it's South Glen 4 or South Glen 5. See, it was behind South Glen Mall. But South Glen Mall now don't exist. Yes, there's a mall there, but it's got a totally different name, and it's an outdoor mall called Streets of South Glen. And the only two things that are left that were there before 
before they did the demolition was the building where the Macy's was that's closed and the building where the, 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 the freestanding building where the um, Sears was that's also closed. Yeah. And he rides that until he gets all, and, and it stops all the way in the back on a street, I think it's called Race. He walks over to the theater. He pays for the ticket. He waits in the waiting area, oh, probably about 15 minutes. He goes in at the time when the movie's about to start. He has some popcorn and uh, and either Sprite or uh, Coca-Cola. He watches the movie through and through. And uh, he, le he, 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 gets out of, he gets done there around uh, 6.30, is about the best guess I can make. He catches the next bus, the 24, which would be leaving somewhere between uh, 6.35 and 6.52, yeah. And what happens is, the bus is doing just fine. And it's probably a 66 or 67, uh, if it's not a GMC, it's an Eagle. And when it gets a little, just a little bit past uh, Hamden and University, it stops running and it makes a bad noise. A radiator hose blew and he could hear it go boom and he hears a <laughs> sound. So he 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 gets on the um, PA, you know, like a little walkie talkie mic or a C B mic. He tells him what's going on. And um, what happens is they sit there and they wait for at least 10 minutes for the uh, RTD driver who is about to call it a day to show up. And they, they, they do the switch and everybody gets back on because there's, there's at least five or six people on the bus. And they keep going until they get to a little bit past, um, I think it's roughly about exposition and university near bon near, in, in the Bonnie Bray neighborhood. And the motor starts going. <laughs> <laughs> And it goes this, and it does that, and he shuts it off. And then he waits about another minute, and he starts doing that. It does that, and it does this, Two in a row, two buzzes in a row, start breaking down like that. <laughs> so he says to he he politely says to the driver. He says uh, he, he says driver, he says could you please let me off, I want to walk home. He says, where do you live? And he says, I live just a little past first seven, but. It's, it's winter time. That's a long walk. It's heavy traffic here on Saturday night. He says, driver, with all due respect, I don't care. I've walked this distance before. It's not going to bother me. Okay. So he opens up the door. He lets him go. And um, 
he keeps driving, or excuse, walk, excuse me, walking. When he gets um, close to Alameda, this kid who is uh, probably Filipino, he's, he's tall. Because see, Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie Ramirez is only about 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, this, this guy who's probably Filipino is about six foot tall. And he's and he's he's got kind of a muscular, gr gringy look on his face. He 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 claimed he was he was with uh, the fundamentalist Latter Day Saints or something. And he says, "No, I'm not giving you a dime." Look, he said. I just got a, I, I said, two buses broke down the road. I don't want to hear it, okay? I don't want to hear it. I don't got any money to give you. Just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. And the kid says, well, with you, with you not helping, with you not helping us doing what the Lord wants us to do, Christ is going to punish you. And he says, Oh yeah, he says, and he, and, he, and there's, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll be right back. Okay, I am back. I was really starting. To, I was starting to get hoarse and and frog in my throat, so I got some nice Eldorado bottle purified uh, natural spring water that'll help me out. He, okay, so he says, oh yeah, he says, you see that phone right there? I'm gonna call the cops. You ask me one more frick, one more bleepity bleep time, punk. I'm tired of this. Yeah, I mean Ron Ramirez is getting pretty irritated by what the guy's saying because he knows he's lying. He knows. He can tell by his voice that he's lying. Cause see, with what Ronnie Ramirez has experienced, having customers play games with him, he can tell by the way a person's talking that somebody's lying. You know, he's not some young, he's not some 15, 16, 17 year old kid. Um, just a sec. In fact, it'll say that on the, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's 20 years old. And he's gone through quite a lot. He's got a lot of experience. You know, what he went through before he was a working adult and, and, and what he went through after he started working for a living and being a good guy, being a contributing individual. Okay. So, the guy says, the guy says, um, and, 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 he, and he says it in this uh, embarrassed kind of... Uh, Better tone of voice. The guy, the guy just goes, "Okay, well, God, 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 God bless you." I'm just gonna walk around over on the other side of the street. And when the guy is walking on the other side of the street, he hears this, like that. He can hear it. I mean, it's a faint sound, but he can hear it. He goes, and then he can hear the guy goes, like that. He snorted a couple lines of coke, was what he did. And now he's really starting to get hyper. And he's he's not just walking straight away like this. He's walking this way, and then he's walking that way, and he's walking this way, and he's walking that way, and he's walking this way, and he's walking that way. So what... Um, Ronnie does, when he finally gets across the street, and I'm, I'm, I, I have a mental picturization of this actually being there. It was a church, it's not called that now because it changed denominations and it changed names. It was then called uh, Calvary Temple, but now it's called Pearl 
Pearl something church. The area that would be either towards the back of the church, the side of the church, or the back of the, you know, near the back side of the church, or the or the opposite side, uh, near where those residential homes are. There, I'm, I'm, I, I do remember visually seeing a payphone there. Um, it was first Mountain Bell, and then they changed that over to Mount, uh, U.S. West, and then when Mount, and then when payphones are the way they are nationwide, they, 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 they cut, they, they, they ripped it. They, they, they took it out. They took out the, the big mount. They cut it down. It's gone. And so he, so anyways, he, he, he takes the quarter out of his pocket when he gets to the payphone. He, he has the main phone number of Denver police re memorized by heart. And the dispatch person t lets him talk for a little bit and then puts him on hold and then he takes in a call from a sergeant. It's a man. He's a nice man, but he's also got this kind of serious, very matter of fact, professional type attitude and um, what happens is the sergeant says okay um, Mr. Ramirez would you like a ride to your house he says no he says with all due respect I, I can uh, I can walk there uh, and I can be there within uh, 15 minutes and he says Okay, so here's, here's, here's the situation. This, the, this is the sergeant talking. He says, you go ahead and walk to your apartment. As soon as you get there, or shortly afterward, we're going to come knocking on your front door. And I'm going to have you uh, recant what happened and explain what you saw with this young man. Because if it is who we strongly suspect it is, he's, he is guilty of some pretty serious crimes. Okay, so he starts walking a little faster once he gets off the phone. And he's watching like a hawk the traffic. And uh, when he crosses the north side of the intersection of University and First Avenue, he starts he starts watching the and the and the guy honks at him and says he says come on move move he's in this really big truck that's souped up. And then he and then he runs across the street. And then the and then the driver goes honk honk. And he puts his thumbs up. In the, you know, so you can see it in the windshield. And then he gets to his um, apartment. A little, it, it, I'm pretty sure it was between. Um, Second and Third Avenue, approximately. And um, he 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 uses the the he, he unlocks the front door through this special security key. It's not a house key; it's 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 a specially made one, and it's one of those fairly long, bulky. It wouldn't look it wouldn't look like this. It would it would be at least a little bit longer, about that long. And he runs upstairs. 
He unlocks his apartment. And he presses the play button on the um, on the answering machine. Because see back then, everything was done either by a little micro tape or a regular cassette tape. And he he hears it do the you know while it's rewinding <laughs> and he and one of the calls is from his mom and his mom wants to come down uh, and visit with him for a few hours on the uh, 20th of uh, November yep and, and, and dad was, and dad's going to come along and they're going to stay in a hotel because they've had enough of the, you know the mom and the dad you know the, the sole purpose of why they're coming the mom and the dad have had are, are, are have had enough of Cocker Kansas and in the Denver area even though companies are folding there's a, there's a there's about two or three companies that are expanding so that the uh, economic downturn isn't quite as bad as as it feels to most people but you gotta you gotta have the you gotta have a lot of inside information about which companies are expanding because a whole bunch of other ones are going down the tubes and then the next message is a high school buddy who he hasn't spoken to in over a year and he writes down the phone number of the guy because the guy just moved from one part of the United States to the other and then there is a, a ridiculous idiotic tele telemarketing call <laughs> And then the, the uh, system says end of messages, and then he hears it, and then and then he hears it rewind again, and then all of a sudden he hears this. On his front door. Yep. He knows who it is, so he runs to the door, and there are three people. One is, it's not the man who answered the call, but it's another sergeant that's a patrolman. It's in a policeman's uniform, patrolman's uniform. And the other one is a lady who has a briefcase on her fingernails. She's very well dressed. And the third one is a um, detective who is handsome, but he doesn't, but he's about, he's probably in his late 40s, roughly. And he's got, uh, he, he's, he's, he, he's got a, he's got a coat over, he's got a, he's got a heavy suit coat under his arm, or a policeman's coat over his arm, and he's wearing a really nice, um, light blue um, dress shirt with nice gold cufflinks and it looks it looks like really polished cotton almost silk with these really thin pin, uh, dark blue pinstripes and the detective puts out his hand and he says he says thank you for he says thank you for advising us about this young man that, that we uh, we are pretty sure who he is we need to come in and we need to discuss the case with you. So they come in and one lady sits at the couch, the, the, the patrolman sits, stands up, and the, uh, the, the detective sits at this nice little coffee, coffee table that is only a two or three seater. It's, it's what's, I think it's what's called a, 
a, a nook table or a table nook. Yeah. And he starts opening things and he says, um, he, he, he says to me, he says, Mr. Ramirez, do sit down. He says, go ahead and sit down at the, at, at this chair over here. I'm going to show you some photographs. And the photographs are, three, I mean, it's the, it's the way the guy's hair is. And in one of them, instead of being clean shaved, he's got this, he's, he's got like this horseshoe must, mustache that's kind of bushy. You know, how long the hair is around them, how, how, how far it sticks out. And um, another photograph is him kind of looking like Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. He's got that bolero hat with a bright yellow band around this area. And he's got a mustache and a goatee and a little French tickler right here. Yeah. And he's he's got a couple of gold rings that are, you know, pretty, you know, flashy. You know, they're they're they look like they're about this big. And they got some rustic, you know, nice, fashionable rusticated uh, markings on it or creations on it and he said and 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 then he and then he keeps looking at these at least about three or four times he says this one right here he says I can tell this is the same guy but he looked about like that with this uh, as, as though how his face looks present and then he t talks about how he heard the guy snort a couple lines of cocaine, yeah, and about how he was pay walking back and forth like this, up and down the opposite side of uh, University Boulevard. I mean, not literally like this, but like this. And, you know, doing stuff like this and like going like that. He knew the guy was acting very suspicious. It was more than the drugs, he was acting very suspicious in other ways. And um, he said that the guy had a t shirt on from either uh, Van Halen, Rat or something like that, but he couldn't he couldn't tell what it was because the way because his coat covered most of it up. And it was a black parachute coat with red markings on the sleeves. You know, here and here. Yep. And um, then what they do is they get out, one of them leaves and comes back with a laptop. I mean, it, it wouldn't be the type of laptop now. It would be a little bit bigger, and it would, instead of being about like this when it's folded up, it'd be probably about like this. It'd be, you know, heavy, it'd be fairly heavy and bulky. And it would have uh, certain, uh, I don't know the name for it, but certain uh, ports that would connect certain things like uh, it wouldn't be USB it would be uh, Cat5 SCSI uh, things and, and you know where you connect certain devices to it that were the end thing back then but now they're majorly uh, outdated and very hard to find nowadays and the odds are going to work are not too high
and the and the detective starts going. You know, he just keeps typing and typing and typing and typing. And then the detective excuses himself again. And he comes back and he plugs into the one of the wall sockets a, a laser printer that is about this tall and about that wide and he puts in the paper and it makes this <laughs> sound and he goes <laughs> you know that type of sound that's the best impression I could make. And three different people, the three people that are signing it, and then he signs it. And then he signs another form. And then what he does is he, um, I, I, think, I think it might have one of those what would be on all in one printers it'd be it'd have like a copier feature he lifts up the lid the 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 lid that would go like this it would be on like a copier or like an all in one printer and he presses the button and he goes wing and he hears and, and the printer makes it sound again and then he does it the second time. And then um, they, they, they talk about a few more little things. And then the, the detective makes two more trips back and forth after the other two people leave. And he, he takes out a business card out, out of his shirt pocket and gives it to him and that's it. Well, um, after the uh, detectives leave, he what he turns on. This isn't. This would not be a um, remote control TV. It would probably be a 13-inch or a 15-inch color TV. That's a dial. Or it goes... Or... You know what I mean. <laughs> and he, 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 he goes through the... Um, he goes through the channels. until he finds an old program. Okay, so after he keeps flipping through the channels and he sees some reruns of some TV series that, have, that were canceled a few years before 1984 and some news programs and some, and some things on UHF, um, he, he, he shuts out the TV for a bit and he goes in, he goes over to the freezer and he finds some Safeway um, hamburger patties and he fries a hamburger and he takes some onions and he, and he sautés the onions a certain way in a separate skeleton and he um, he eats some nice, um, yeah, tortilla chips. And then he turns on the TV. And he thought, I got a feeling something good is on PBS 6. Or KRMA TV, I think it was. 
what is what it was that still is. So he goes to channel six, and here's what happens. He sees a very interesting documentary about the artist Vincent Van Gogh. Yeah, I've heard a lot of things about the artist Vincent Van Gogh. I don't know verbatim what happened with him because I heard he cut one of his ears off because it was hurting so bad. But I've heard from a lot of, you know, people that I know, you know, just talking one-on-one -on -one with people I know and talking and hearing about it in YouTube clips and, uh, t you know, other TV programs talking about Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh may have been schizophrenic. A lot of people think he was schizophrenic. And I personally think there's a good possibility that's true. But whether that was actually correct or not, all I can say is it's hard to say. Whoops, sorry about that. So he watches the Vincent Van Gogh program until about 11.30, a little after midnight probably. And then he's getting really tired. And he he gets into his he, he takes off his clothes, gets into his sleepy pants or whatever, or undies, and he crawls into bed and he goes to sleep. Shortly after he wakes up the next day, at about nine nine thirty in the morning, roughly. And he showered and shaved right in the middle, right after he makes, he, he finishes eating his breakfast, the, the, the phone rings. And it's Denver police telling him they caught the guy. He was captured somewhere between 7.15 and 7.30 a.m trying to pull off a robbery of a convenience store gas station with a with a shotgun. Yeah, he didn't shoot anybody. But the person who reported the robbery after the person took off, he knew by the voice and by what little features he could see under the ski mask who it was. And this is just a fictional name. It would be Philip DeMano, D-E-M-A-N-O. And the guy was 23 years old. Yeah. He was arrested because the the person who reported the robbery knew knew the guy, knew Philip Damano. And he 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 he, he contact and and while he was waiting, while the while the clerk at the the gas station, he called some friends of his who, who knew the guy, and they he, he reported when the police came to 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 to, 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 to do the report and the and the the crime scene investigation. He told he told the the patrolman where he knew where he lived. And sure enough, somewhere between 7.45 and 8 a.m., they kicked the door down, and they have guns pointed at him, and they place him under arrest. Yeah, Philip went down. 
being such a bad, 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 bad dude. Well, I got other ideas for a story like this, but it's unfortunately writer's block is set in, so I don't know what else to write. But thank you everybody for listening to this vlog. I know it's been over an hour. Thank you and good evening and a good day. Bye-bye.